And uh, today we're looking at uh, Matthew's account of uh, the foretelling of um, Jesus' birth. And uh, Matthew's account gives us uh, the perspective from um, Joseph, whereas Luke, he tells the same story, but he tells it from Mary's perspective. And uh, each one has different emphasis. So uh, today we're looking at Matthew. So it's Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Okay, hear, hear the word of God. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call him his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Oh, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we uh, hear this uh, wonderful message again, may you help us to see it afresh. Uh, Lord, we pray that our hearts would be open to hear uh, what it means and how we can respond. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would take away any distraction from our mind, help us to be able to hear you speak to us through your word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if you can imagine being Joseph on that day. That day that he heard that his wife-to-be was pregnant. Can you imagine the shock, uh, the confusion, the, the embarrassment? I mean, he's engaged to a girl who's now pregnant. He knows the pregnancy has had nothing to do with him. Talk about awkward, because not only is it very confusing, but in that culture, this was a very shameful thing to have occurred. And how would he explain it? How could he make sense of the situation? Now, I'm not sure for certain, but I think Mary would have said something. Because we know from Luke's account that Mary, uh, she had an angel come to her before uh, she um, became pregnant. And the angel told her what would happen. And so I imagine Mary would have said that, that she would have told Joseph what's going on. But how would that make sense to him? How could she be pregnant like miraculously like this? How does that even work? And so the more Joseph thought about it, it seems the more he came to this conclusion that he has no choice but to let her go. And so he purposes in his heart that he's going to end uh, the marriage, or the engagement, I should say, and uh, he, he could make a big scene of it. He could publicly shame her because it looks like something wrong has gone on. But he's a decent fellow, so he looks for a way to do it in the quietest way possible, a way that would not cause any ripples in the community. And just as he goes about to do that, he gets an angel come to him and tell him exactly what Mary already knew that this was indeed a miraculous conception. But along with that, the angel actually tells Joseph not one, but two names that this child will have. And these two names must have shocked Joseph even more than finding out about the pregnancy itself. Because these two names reveal who the child is and what he will do. It reveals his identity and his mission. See, these two names are Jesus in verse 21 and Emmanuel in verse 23. 
And these two names tell us who he is and why he came. And so all that I want to do this morning is reflect on these two names with you. We're going to start with Emmanuel, which tells us who Jesus is, and then we're going to look at the the name Jesus. And I want to spend some time thinking about these two names and then what they mean for us today. Okay, so first of all, Emmanuel. Now, just think about it. What could the angel possibly say to Joseph that would shock him more than finding out his fiancée is pregnant? It is this name, Emmanuel. So verse 23, the angel explains uh, that the identity of the child, he actually uses a quote from Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, which says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, Isaiah recorded that statement 700 years before Jesus came on the scene. And so for 700 years, people had been wondering, what did that promise mean? What is this virgin birth thing? What does this this God with us statement mean? Uh, For many, it probably just sounded like God was promising some kind of leader who would come along and it would lead so well that the nation would experience a time of blessing under his leadership in such a way that it kind of felt like God's presence was with them in a way that it hadn't been in darker times. And so perhaps for many, the idea was God with us is just a figurative thing. You know, God's presence is kind of experienced in a, in a, in a fresh way. But that's not the case according to the New Testament. And Matthew shows us that the coming, with the coming of Jesus, Emmanuel which means God with us, is to be taken literally. God is literally with us in the coming of Jesus. See, this is saying God, the creator of the entire universe, has come into the world as a human being. That's what the angel is telling Joseph. The child born to Mary is God himself. You know, if one shock wasn't bad enough, can you imagine hearing that? God? It's God in the flesh in Mary's womb? What? Now, this is not the only time in the Bible that, that the Bible claims that Jesus is God. Okay? If you follow the story of Matthew over and over again, we hear, who is this man? And he's not just a man, he's God. It's the same in Mark, Luke and John and the rest of the New Testament. Over and over again, we're told that Jesus was not just a man, that he is God in the flesh. And so you've got this statement in Colossians 2 verse 9 that says, in Jesus the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Do you hear that? The whole fullness of deity. Not just a little bit of deity. The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily in Jesus. And then you've got even Jesus himself. You read the gospel accounts and Jesus from his own lips is constantly claiming to be God. Just to give one example of that, there's that time when he was speaking to a group of Jewish teachers and he made this statement that absolutely infuriated them. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And there, not only is Jesus claiming that he has existed even before Abraham was, which was thousands of years before Jesus was actually born, but to say, I am, I am is God's name that he revealed to Moses at the burning bush. And so here's Jesus saying that that's me, I am, okay, God, Yahweh, that's me, that's what Jesus is saying. And so this is who he is. Emmanuel, God with us. This is God in the flesh. And so this means, well, this actually, Emmanuel distinguishes Jesus from every other human being who has ever been born. Because every other human being who has ever been born is just that, a human being. But Jesus, yes, he's a human being, fully human, but he's also fully God. Emmanuel distinguishes Jesus from every other religious founder. You know, there's lots of religions, lots of religious founders. Many of them claim to have come from God with a message from God to tell you how to find God. But not Jesus. 
He's not someone come from God to tell us how to find God. He is God who has come to find us. And the more you think about this, the more incredible this claim is. I mean, can you imagine if they had ultrasounds in that day? Can you imagine going to Mary's ultrasound and seeing on that screen this little body? And you're thinking to yourself, hang on, this is a manual. (laughs) Wouldn't that just blow your mind? Or even when Jesus was born and he was laying there in a manger and you could go up to him and pick him up and hold him in your arms and you're thinking to yourself, I'm holding in my arms the one who is greater than the entire universe, bigger than the entire universe. This is God in the flesh. Or can you imagine seeing Jesus after he'd grown up, walking the dusty streets of Israel, and you'll look at him and outwardly he just looks like any other guy on the street. Just like Isaiah predicted, that he he had no form or majesty that we would look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. And yet he's going around claiming to be God doing things that only God can do, speaking with such authority that it's the authority of God himself. And, and everything about him, you know, his claims, his deeds, his words, his presence, his character, everything about him, it says he's more than a human being, that there's something else about him that's going on. And it was so compelling that even Jewish people came to believe him and worship him as God. Now I highlight that because that is actually quite extraordinary, that Jewish people would, would, would worship Jesus as God. The reason that's extraordinary is because the Jewish people, they're the least likely to accept that a human being could be God in the flesh. I mean, the, the Jews, they knew who God was. They knew that God is Uh, transcendent, infinite, eternal. They knew that he is all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere at once. The Jews knew that the whole universe was created by a word from God that compared to God, the universe is like a tiny little speck. That the God who made all things is the God who keeps everything going. He's, He's constantly involved. He's running the universe. They knew the proverb that says that the, the God has the king's heart in his hand and directs it like a watercourse. Okay, this is a God who rules and reigns over everything. And yet here they are, looking in the face of a man and saying, my God, the creator in the flesh. This is incredible. They came to worship the man, Jesus, as God. Now, how could they come to that conclusion? Like, what was this? Was this some kind of uh, celebrity status just gone wild? You know how it is. There's some big name celebrities out there and they have this huge uh, following of fans on Instagram and all of that sort of stuff. And sometimes, you know, these big name celebrities, they have fans that love them and adore them so much, even to the point where they almost worship them and, and give them kind of like a godlike status. I mean, is that what happened with Jesus? And it just got a bit out of hand and then they eventually came to this, you know, the word of mouth kept going on and on and then eventually they turned him into God. Is that what happened? Well, here's the thing about that. The people who worship the big name celebrities, the ones who love and adore them are the ones that have nothing to do with them, who only ever see them from afar. The people who know celebrities personally the people who actually have to live with them, do they look at them with godlike awe? <laughs> Not a chance, because they know what they're really like. Okay? And all of that greatness and glory that they have up on that cinema screen or up on the stage, when you get to know them personally, you realise that that greatness and glory, it doesn't actually exist. They're just like everyone else, sometimes even worse. <laughs> but see, with Jesus... It's the people who lived with him. It's the people who knew him personally, who saw him even in his most troubled moments. And they saw what he was really like. And they came to the conclusion, this is 
God among us. This is the Holy One of Israel. This is the, the great King, the Creator. This is the One who made us. Did you notice that song? The One who made Mary, now in Mary's womb? That's what they came to conclude. Now, of course, it took them a while to get that. The resurrection was really the turning point uh, for most of them. You know, that's where you have the penny finally dropping for Thomas when he, when he sees Jesus risen and he goes, my Lord and my God. But all of that was realising was what was true all along. This one born to Mary is Emmanuel, God with us. Now, if it's true that God has come in, in human flesh, then what does that tell us about God? It tells us that God is real. Okay, he's real. You can get to know him. Right? It tells us that you can know him personally, you can know what he's like because Jesus has revealed to us what he is like. And Jesus has revealed God in a way that we can understand, in a way that we can actually relate to. You know, God isn't some uh, unknowable force. He's not some, you know, just a bunch of philosophical propositions that people made up because they're trying to make sense of all the mysteries of life. And the only way you can do it is to fill in all the gaps with, with a divine being. That's, that's, that's not who God is. Who is he? He's real. He's personal. He's actually stepped into our history. He's stepped into our world. He's walked among us in real flesh and blood. And so you don't have to guess what God is like. You can know him personally because his life is recorded for us right here in the pages of Scripture. Okay, if you want to know what's the Bible about, it's all about Jesus from beginning to end. All Scripture is about me, said Jesus. See, and his life is recorded for us in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, by eyewitnesses people who rub shoulders with the one who is both God and man. And they recorded what they saw, what they heard, what they experienced, so that we can know the one who is Emmanuel, God with us. But here's the real crunch for us. If this is who Jesus is, if he is Emmanuel, if he is God in the flesh, then there's only two possible ways you can deal with Jesus. Two possible ways. One way is to look at his claims and to decide that they're all wrong. And if you do that, then the only logical thing is to run for your life. Because anyone who claims to be God must be either insane or even dangerous if he's wrong. But if he's right, there's only one logical thing to do, to fall down before him and worship him and give your whole life over to him in service because if he's God, then that's the only thing that makes sense. I guess there is a middle way though. The middle way today maybe you've heard this for the first time. Jesus is God, what? It's intrigued you enough to want to know more? Here's what you need to do. Look into it. Don't ignore this. Read the Bible for yourself. Read the story of Jesus. Find out if these claims are true. Right? But the one thing you can't do today is just shrug your shoulders and go home thinking, well, there's nothing important about the birth of Jesus. So I'll just carry on as if nothing ever happened. No, no. If he's Emmanuel, that changes everything. The God who created the whole world has actually entered in and you can know him. You can know him personally because he is God with us. So that's the first thing, that's, that's Emmanuel. Emmanuel is one of his names. Um, but this passage also shows us that the name Jesus also has some incredible significance to it. And so let's think about the name Jesus. So you look at the passage again in verse 21. Uh, this is where the angel um, you know, he's talking to Joseph. And he, he says, well, he gives Joseph a few commands. He says, First of all, you're to marry um, Mary, right? So that's all good. But then he gives Joseph another command, and that is to name the son born Jesus. And this name Jesus, it's, a, it's actually 
The name Jesus is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua. You know, Yeshua. And it's a name that literally means the Lord saves. Uh, but even if we didn't know that, the angel actually explains it for us. Because the explanation that he gives for why Joseph is to name the baby Jesus is in the end of verse 21, which says, For he will save his people from their sins. Okay, so the, the name Emmanuel tells us who Jesus is. The name Jesus tells us what he has come to do. Why has God come into the world to save his people from their... I know it says sins. <laughs> but let's just think about this a little bit more. Let's just imagine that God wrote that sentence and he left the last word off and he says, over to you. How would you finish that sentence? Hey, what would you want if God says, I'm coming into the world to save you? What do you want to be saved from? Or if God said, I'm coming into the world to fix things, what do you want to have fixed? Right? How would you finish that sentence? Because I suspect if it was up to us, we would, we would say, well, we want, to be fixed, uh, we want to be saved from the really bad things in the world and the really bad things in our lives. You know, things like pain and sorrow and injustice and, and sickness. We want to be saved from corrupt governments. We want to be saved from, well, maybe not us, but you know, think about people in other parts of the world today. We want to be saved from war and conflict. We want to be saved from, from death. All the death. That's what we want to be saved from. And see, surely if God is going to show up, these are the things we need to be saved from, right? Well, here's the thing about that. The rest of the Bible goes on to say that God has come in order to save us from all of those things. He has come to save us from sickness and sorrow and pain and injustice and corrupt governments and war and poverty and, and even death. He has come to save us from those things. But here's the thing. He can't do any of that unless he deals with the root cause of all of these problems. So you imagine if you went to the doctor and you've got a, a terrible, life-threatening disease, uh, perhaps some rare form of cancer, and one of the symptoms of this rare form of cancer is a really strange rash. Now, if you go to the doctor for that, it's no help to you if the doctor only examines the symptoms and only gives you a treatment that deals with the symptoms. Okay, it's no help if the doctor gives you a prescription for rash cream and sends you on your way. That's not going to help you. Okay, you need the doctor to focus on the root issue, the cause of all the symptoms. You need the doctor to deal with the root cause. And see, it's the same with all the problems in the world and all the problems in our lives. God hasn't come into the world to put band-aids on things. He hasn't come into the world to put rash cream on things. He's come into the world... And he's brought the true diagnosis of what's wrong and he's come to bring the perfect treatment. Right? Because God knows that all the pain, sorrow, injustice, war, poverty, conflict, sickness, death, these are all just symptoms of something much deeper. And unless that this thing that's deeper is dealt with and is resolved we can never have these other things fixed. And the real cause of the sickness of this world and the real cause of the sickness of our souls is what the Bible calls sin. And sin is not something that can be fixed by us. Sin is not something that we can change or remove. It's, it's something that humanity can't do anything about. You know, all of the uh, education that we provide. We can't, we can't educate ourselves out of sin. All of the scientific advancements are never going to fix sin. All the medical breakthroughs, all of the government spending, all of the technological advancements, all of the counselling sessions, all of the inner resolves, all of the good works, and the trying harder cannot fix sin. It can't remove it. And sin is at the heart of everything that's wrong in us. 
It's at the heart of everything that's wrong in the world. And one way to illustrate what sin is and why it can't be removed by us, one way to illustrate it is to think about the Garden of Eden. You see, when God originally created the world, he created it perfectly. All those things that we've listed that we want to be safe from, none of those things existed in God's perfect creation. And when he made creation, he, he, you know, he made everything to work as it was meant to. He created the world perfect in every way and at the centre of his perfect creation he put humanity there to dwell with him. And it's not as though God needed the world, it's not as though he needed humanity. God is perfectly complete in himself. No, he, he's a trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So he was never lonely or never bored, never lacked anything. And so the reason he created the world and created us was not because he needed us but simply for our benefit. He created so that we could know him, so that we could share in the joy and in the love and in the wonder of his glory. He created us for our benefit. And originally the focal point of that, that glorious purpose of being created to, to share in the glory of God, it all centered in this place called the Garden of Eden. Because the Garden of Eden was the, the focal point where God dwelled in a perfect relationship with humanity. Now, Eden was meant to be the place of Emmanuel, actually. God with us. But see, not long after it all started, Adam, uh, the first man, he was acting as our representative. And he decided that he didn't want to live under God's rule. Didn't want to do things God's way. And so he rejected God, which brought sin into humanity and also brought a curse on creation. And so God had no choice but to kick humanity out of that Garden of Eden. And that kicking them out, that's a picture of the separation between humanity and God. And so every single person born into this world ever since Adam and Eve are all born in a state of separation from God. And that state of separation is what is at the heart of sin. And you can see it work out because now every single human being is born with this heart that doesn't want to submit to God, doesn't want to do things God's way. We have a heart that wants to be separated from God. We don't want to find him. We want to live lives our way. We want to be our own God. And you can see that in our, in our lives every day when... You know, in all the ways that we trample over God's commands, thinking that there's no consequences. But there are consequences. There are consequences for every sin. God cannot ignore sin. He can't just pretend it doesn't exist. I mean, that, that would go against who God is. Yes, God is loving and kind and good, but he's also holy and righteous and just, and therefore God cannot ignore sin or just make it go away or sweep it under a blanket or throw it out to the deepest galaxy. He can't do that. He has to punish sin. Otherwise, he would cease to be who he is. And he told Adam, even before Adam rejected him, that the punishment for sin is death, eternal death. See, that's the predicament we're in as human beings. But here's the good news. God has come into the world, but he, come, he came with a plan. And what's the plan? He came to punish sin without punishing us. That's the good news. That's what verse 21 is getting at. When, when the angel told Joseph, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so here we have a verse that's pointing us to the cross. You know, even before Jesus is born, we're already thinking about his death. We're thinking about the cross already. And so here we see why Jesus came. Why did God come into the world as a man? Right? Why not come as something, I don't know, big and exciting, like a, like a whirlwind, like he did for Job, or... or um, a big pillar of fire like he did for Moses. Why is it that, he, that the, the full, you know, the goal of the plan was for God to become a man? Why? 
Here it is, it's so he could die. It's so he could die in our place on that cross. That's why he came. And so for you, the good news, everyone who trusts in Jesus is saved from your sin. Right? Because, why? Because Jesus went to that cross and took the punishment in your place. That's the good news of Christmas. And so if Jesus has died for you, that separation of sin that existed between you and God, it's gone. God is now for you. God is now with you. See, that's how you can have a manual. God with you only if his name is Jesus and saves you from your sin. And of course, Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose on that third day. He ascended into heaven and he promises that he will come back one day. And remember that big list of all the things we want to be saved from? One day it's all going to be true. The day that Jesus comes back, all of the sorrow, all of the pain, all of the suffering, even death itself will be gone forever. And the Eden that we lost right back at the beginning, we will have once again. And so now you can see why the name of Jesus is so wonderful. The name Jesus. You, know, you hear it a lot these days, don't you? Especially if you watch TV. The name Jesus, constantly spoken. Every time you hear it, do you know what you need to think? He will save his people from their sins. Because that's what it means. <laughs> You know, there's an old song, which, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's not a Christmas song, but it goes like this. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes our sorrows, heals our wounds, and drives away all fear. Okay, why does the name of Jesus sound so sweet? Because it means he will save his people from their sins. And when you know that he has done that for you, there is nothing sweeter than the name of Jesus. That's what we need more than anything else. And having him save us from our sins, that's the beginning of him making everything new. And so the future for everyone who is trusting in Jesus today, the future is one of hope. It's one of joy. It's one of peace. See, Jesus' death for us means that God is with us right now and it means that God is with us forever. If you belong to Jesus, he will never leave you or forsake you. That's his promise. See, his name really does mean Emmanuel. He's with you. No matter what. No matter how dark life will be. You know, like the psalm says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. See? And just like he's with us now, he'll be with us forever. And one day we will be in Eden, but it will be Eden that's so much better. It's what the end of the Bible looks forward to. Revelation 21. Have a look at verses 3 to 4. And notice all the times it mentions the word with. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see this is right at the end of the future, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. See, that's what's coming. And so the name Emmanuel, that tells us who Jesus is. The name Jesus tells us why he has come. And because he is God with us, who has saved us from our sin, the future is certain. Not even death can rob that from you. He's coming to make everything new. And so the question for you today is, have you put your trust in him? Right, Emmanuel means God with us. But the question you need to ask yourself is, are you with him? That's the only hope. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful Saviour that we have. 
We thank you for your son. We thank you for his willingness to take on this mission of coming into the world to die and to go to that cross and to bear the punishment for our sin on his shoulders. We thank you, Father, that he rose again victorious and now that we have this, this joy that we can look forward to the, the end when, when all things will be made new. And so, Father, we pray that each of us here would have this hope in our hearts that all of our fears of, of death and of sin and the consequences of sin, that all of that would be taken away through faith in Jesus. And Father, we pray for all of those people in this surrounding area and in our families who don't know Jesus. We pray that they would also come to know this, this wonderful joy and hope. And so may you help us to go out and, and tell them about him. And we pray it in his name. Amen.